I've known Larry for a couple of years, and it was 1986. As I recall, pretty much out of the blue, he uh, called me and asked me if um, I wanted to build a figure to burn um, at the beach for the summer solstice. It needed no further justification than the impulse that created it. That was enough. And uh, we hadn't any plan except to build a man and take it to the beach and burn it. We assembled this stick figure that was the first Burning Man, and we hauled it to the San Francisco Baker Beach and rounded up our girlfriends and our kids and a couple of friends, and there were maybe 10 or 12 of us there. I always call it a family picnic. typical kind of foggy, blustery evening, and at some point I walked over and dumped a gallon of gas on top of this figure and threw a match on it and... We didn't rent a venue, we used public land. It was gorilla. It was illegal. From a small gathering on the beach in San Francisco, the ritual now known as Burning Man has grown into a large event and people from all over the world join in every year. Four years after its birth, the event moved to the Black Rock Desert, which then became its permanent annual home. Since then, the attendance has increased exponentially. The newfound freedom of this very last frontier of the American West draws many souls who feel a disconnection with their consumerist society. Nowadays, the festival attracts 50,000 people to northern Nevada. It has transformed into a temporary city with its own social and political structure and a distinctive culture that is characterized by a wild abandon in creativity and festivity of all participants. How did the original family picnic evolve into such an emblematic movement? When Larry Harvey, the co-founder of Burning Man, arrived in San Francisco in the early 80s, he discovered a city vibrant with art and culture, influenced by the countercultural and spiritual movements of the late 60s. San Francisco is full of eccentrics. Since its inception, it was a gold rush town. So always a town where people could invent themselves. Uh, 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 the crown jewel of the Wild West in some place, a place of some sophistication, some. Uh, and that's grown into a, a major city, and, and uh, in, in which people come to be what they what they imagined they they could be, and that was very much the feeling in the little world I lived in at the time. During the early '80s, Larry Harvey was introduced to different circles of creative kinds. One was a group of carpenters who later helped build and design the first effigies. He was also introduced to Mary Grauberger, who was organizing spontaneous rituals, burning art made of found objects on the beach in San Francisco. The 
combination of these encounters were a direct contribution to the genesis of the Burning Man event. At the same time in San Francisco, other activities were also flourishing underground as a reaction to the increasing cultural and political conservatism of that era. One specific group of people under the name of the Suicide Club, which greatly influenced Burning Man, had just started creating what they called experiences outside of mainstream society. I was 18, but uh, I say the average age for the group was probably mid-20s, and there were some, a few older people. Certainly for an 18-year-old, you know, former juvenile delinquent, it was, a, it was an extremely attractive organization because you could do all these adventurous, insane, wonderful things with sort of a moral grounding. And so I went on the first initiation of the Suicide Club, and we were blindfolded, you know, 50 people were blindfolded, and it was an astonishing feeling putting yourself in this situation where you had no idea what was going to happen. And that was the, a big part of the attraction, and also helped establish my whole world view and how I've dealt with the world since then. a variety of types of events. We would infiltrate cults, it was one thing we liked to do just to find out what they were really about. We would do street theater. We would climb into abandoned buildings and do events in them. With the Suicide Club, John Law had entered a world heavily influenced by the Surrealist and Dada movements under the lead of Gary Warren, the founder of the Suicide Club. Warren was a visionary who died tragically long before his time. He considered that fears are a freeze on the future, the floodgate that stops our imaginings. He wanted to create experiences that would be like living out a fantasy or a film in order to disconnect with our everyday reality. There were a couple of articles written in the beginning of the group but then uh, we, we uh, turned down all kinds of press later on. We didn't want to be written about because we didn't want the police to come and find us. We didn't want too many people to show up. And they were very much underground. They were so far underground I couldn't find them. I couldn't participate in all these. Consequently, over several years, we became more insular, and I think we didn't get a lot of new people coming in, and that's one of the reasons why we eventually suicided. But it also allowed the group to be, to be more pure in a lot of ways. After the club disbanded in 1982, many members felt a void that led to the 1986 creation of the Cacophony Society. By that time, Michael Michael had made contact with the group and became an integral new member. What I decided to do was get involved with the Cacophony Society and make it more open to actually encourage uh, wider participation. There was an incredible event that ran for 14 years. It was actually started with the Suicide Club and continued with Cacophony. It is the annual formal dinner on the Golden Gate Bridge, on the walkway. It was a really incredible event. We would put on really fancy clothes, top hats, tuxedos, uh, women wearing evening gowns, and we would bring all this food out, sometimes a barbecue, and have this incredible dinner and we would get away with it. Sometimes it would take an hour or two before the authorities would show up. The Cacophony Society and Burning Man were born the same year in the same city, and it wouldn't take long before a group attracted by surrealist experiments would notice a giant burning on the beach. The second Burning Man, I mean, we did a little poster for it, so it became, it started to become a little bit more of a deliberate effort and something that I was investing in. Maybe 40 people or so showed up and we burned this thing and 
It was kind of like a bigger family picnic. a couple of years later in 1988 that I had heard about this man that they were going to burn through some pagan friends of mine. So I was able to attend then and I thought that this is incredible. It should fit right in with the Cacophony Society. And I listed the event in the Cacophony Society newsletter. So at the time Cacophony had a mailing list of several hundred people. So all of a sudden a lot of people showed up. And that's when Burning Man really took off and started to grow. We were doing pretty involved security for that event because by that point in time, it was clear the police knew that it happened every year. We were listening to the police. We, you know, we had uh, police scanners and they were looking for us. So the fact that we got the whole thing down on the beach without getting busted was astonishing to start with. But uh, so we, we worked on that for a while. We got all the pieces dropped off, got them down the hill. And the numbers on the beach grew to the point where we had, I don't know, 600 people the last year that we did it on the beach. Who knows how many people were there? Thousands? At least a thousand? I mean, you, you can't tell. It was just covered with people. It was very shocking to us. We'd never conceived of a public. We didn't have a bullhorn. We had no way to even address them. There were so many people coming down that about half an hour later, the cops did find out where we were and ended up uh, not allowing us to burn the, the figure right there um, at the time. That's a direct order. Do it now. And they made us promise that we keep it up, but we shouldn't burn it. So as soon as they went, people were going, burn it, burn it, burn it. So I was up on one side of the thing with a can of gas. And Larry was on the other side. He kept saying, what do you think we should do? What do you think we should do? And I said, burn it, burn it. He said, no, if I do it now, I'll get into so much trouble. I can't do this. And there was like this whole tug of war going on between people. It was just a roadside attraction to them. It, 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 they had invested nothing in it. And, and it was a mere spectacle. And when we didn't put on the show, they grew rageful. It almost turned hostile because people really wanted to see it burn. A fellow tried to strangle me. Three times he'd walked up to the field. The three times he'd lit his little big lighter. Someone had splashed fuel on it. It was that, that close to going up. The third time I lost patience. I talked to him twice and I, and I grabbed him. I was like, Jesus, look at this. People are really into this thing. And I witnessed in a, in, in a small compass a, a miniature riot. The most ironic thing is though that they, they, we brought it back to a parking lot, okay? It was where we had built this thing. It was, it was like a, a gated area in a parking lot. And uh, the guy chopped it up for firewood and burned it anyway! <laughs> the ritual had become too popular and needed a new burning ground. As it happened, the year before, a group from the Cacophony Society traveled 400 miles away to the Black Rock Desert to participate in a wind sculpture festival organized by Mel Lyons and John Bogart. And Mel Lyons was a Berkeley artist who worked with John Bogart. And they did two big events that I know of out there prior to Burning Man coming out there. One of them was a giant croquet game using trucks and earth balls. And they had telephone poles as wickets. Okay, and they'd get a ball and they hit it with a truck and it would roll in. And they had these giant hoops that they'd go through. And the other event that 